Good afternoon, everybody. Welcome to the Teaching Kitchen here at New York Presbyterian Hudson Valley Hospital. My name is Emily, and today I'm going to be your culinary captain on your journey to Provence. So if you want to imagine that you're taking a summer travel a vacation to Provence with me, uh, we can be very creative <laughs> in our imaginations these days, I find. So certainly um, buckle up. I do feel like a pilot whenever I do these classes, you know, um, there, there may be some turbulence along the way, but I believe we're going to get all of our recipes done. I'm really thrilled that you're joining me here as usual for our, uh, for our classes. And if this is your first time, I'm not usually this silly. Well, sometimes I am, but today I am. <laughs> so welcome everyone. Um, just to kind of settle into your space, it is hot outside. So definitely take a moment to take some nice cooling breaths. If you want, you can even close your eyes. And you can picture a field of lavender or maybe an olive grove, or maybe it's the blue Mediterranean Sea. Just allow your imagination to take you there to a beautiful Provence, countryside, seaside, flowerscape, whatever resonates for you. And, uh, and let's cook from that space today. So we're going to channel, channel our inner Provence. So for those of you who are not familiar with Provence, there's a little map here where it is, right? So it's this region right here on the Mediterranean in the south of France um, that kind of uh, bumps up against Italy there. So there's a lot of um, overlap in some of the cuisine. Um, I think of Provence as having a very um, herb rich cuisine and lots of delicious golden olive oil and um, pestos and things like that. So that is what comes to mind for me when I think of uh, Provence. I also think of salad niçoise, um, which is a very common kind of dish. But I wanted to introduce you to a few things that you might not be familiar with. Um, the first is the Tien Provençal, T-A-I-N, and I don't know if I'm pronouncing that correctly, even though my mother is French, I think I would be embarrassing her right now. Tien Provençal um, is basically like a ratatouille, but in kind of a pie shape. So we're going to start with that because it does take about 35 minutes to bake, so I'm going to jump right into it. We're going to make a soup au pistou. Pistou is very similar to pesto. Um, it's basically garlic, basil, olive oil, a little Parmesan cheese. There's no pine nuts in it, which is traditional for pesto. Um, and that's swirled on top of the soup to give it a bright, fresh basil, garlic kind of flavor. And then the last recipe we're making is a chèvre tartine. Now, chèvre is basically the French word for goat cheese. And tartine is sort of like a sand an open-faced sandwich. That's basically what it is, tartine. I prefer tartine to sandwiches. I always feel like sandwiches have too much bread and not enough, um, you know, not enough filling. <laughs> so this is a little bit of a different ratio. So that's going to be our menu today. As usual, if you have any questions, please feel free to put them in the chat box, which thankfully Alita has already started off for us. Alita is going to be moderating our program today. Alita, thank you for being our moderator. And let's get started. We're going to jump right in. So the first step in making your, your um, sort of ratatouille style um, dish, it's, uh, it's different from a quiche because there's no egg filling. It's different from a, there's no crust. It's different from a ratatouille because everything is baked in this beautiful dish um, instead of kind of sauteed together. And I like it because you can just throw it into the oven and just kind of let it simmer for a while. So we're going to start by sauteing our red onion. I'm going to show you how I cut that up. Um, and I did want to kind of move things along because it is a lengthy bake for this one. So you really want to get it in, you know, as quickly as possible. So I'm going to start with our red onion in our pan. And this is going to be uh, sauteed. And then we're going to put it at the bottom of our dish and everything will get layered on top of it, which is really yummy. I'm going to start with that saute. And then if you are cutting up your onion, I'll show you how to do that. Um, I'm using red onion, but you could use definitely a white onion, cipollini onion. This is really good with shallots as well. So feel free to get creative with whatever alliums you enjoy. 
you don't like any of them, you can leave them out. You can make this without the onion. Just um, layering in the vegetables, that would work too. Okay. So this is our red onion. This is a really big one. I mean, it's, I don't want to say it's the size of my brain because I feel like I'm, I would be hopefully underselling the size of my brain. <laughs> so I'm going to start by trimming off the top, but it's a big one, trimming off the bottom. And then we're going to cut it in half to peel it. So cut it in half, peel off that outer skin, and you're ready to go. So because this is a particularly big one, what I'm gonna do is, I'm gonna do, this is the top and this is the bottom, right? Top and bottom. I'm gonna start by putting my hand flat on top and making a couple of parallel cuts first. One, two, because I do want this to be cut fairly small. Three. So now we've gone parallel to the cutting board. And now we're going to go perpendicular to the cutting board. I hope I'm remembering my geometry lessons. <laughs> so just a few cuts this way and that way. You can also buy your onion already sliced and diced. You want to take the easy route. A couple of chops across this way. Curl those fingers, tuck that thumb, and you've got your diced onion. Um, once onion is diced, you can freeze it. So it's always good to dice a little extra, more than you need. And then, um, you know, add it to the freezer for when you need diced onions. You, you can skip this whole step. Oh, onions always like tickle my nose, almost like a sneeze um, that's going to arrive. All right, so we're starting with that saute. I'm going to set this to the side, and then we're going to get the rest of our ingredients ready. So I have some herbs. This is some fresh thyme. You can add fresh rosemary in here too if you want to just herb it up a little bit more. So our thyme is from the garden. and you can see whenever you're stripping herbs like thyme or rosemary, there's kind of a spot, right? This is all very, very, very firm. And then there's kind of a spot where it gets a little bit soft and weaker, right? So what I usually do is I find that sort of softer spot. I hold it there. I pull against the grain to get the leaves, right? So now I've got most of them. And then I just pick the leaves off from the top, right? Because if you hold, see, because if you hold the top, and just pull down from the very top, all of, um, it's just gonna break and you're not gonna get your leaves off the stem very easily. So find that weak, you know, sort of weaker spot on the, on the stem, hold from just below that, pull against it, and then pick your leaves off the top. Okay, so we're gonna get that in here with our onion, saute the herbs. We're gonna add some um, garlic to this as well. Let's get that ready. So you can go ahead and use the side of your knife, press down for a little smash and peel off the skin. You can also use the bottom of your jar or your can, smash it, peel the skin off that way. That's easy too. Trim the bottom, right? That little tough spot where the garlic was stuck to the earth, didn't want to disconnect. I'm gonna go ahead and start mincing. So I'm not adding the garlic at the same time as the onion because garlic cooks a lot faster than onions. So you want to um, just kind of stagger the cooking on that. So start with your onion, so it gets a little soft and translucent. Then you can add the garlic and things like that. Because otherwise, it's going to burn while the onion is going to still not be burned. Okay, so this is almost ready. The onions are starting to soften. They're starting to be a little more um, translucent in nature. And we can add that garlic next and our herbs and let those kind of cook together for a bit. So in goes the garlic. I have some mince in some slice. It's all good. It's all gonna end up in the same place. And then again, our beautiful fresh green herbs going in. Questions and comments? So far, so good. Everybody's traveling to Provence in their mind's eye, I'm sure. <laughs> they're, on, they're on the train, no questions yet. <laughs> <laughs> okay, perfect. All right, I feel like maybe I need to be teaching this class in French, right? That would be the full authentic experience. But um, then we'd have to get to a translator. <laughs> All right, so there we go. We're going to start slicing up our vegetables. So we have three essential vegetables for this. One is our zucchini. It's almost zucchini season. I'm very excited about that. I love zucchini. Um, it's in the same family as melons, spaghetti squash, and cucumbers. 
And the variety that we most use is actually first developed in Italy in the early 1800s. Um, it's very low calorie. It's a great kind of pasta substitute. Um, and it's particularly high in, vi in vitamin A, which is increased by cooking. So that's a good, uh, good thing to know, too. So we're going to start by trimming the top and trimming the bottom. And you just want to go for very, very thin slices, sort of a quarter inch. Each one should be about a quarter inch. Oops, that one is a little too thin. Try to get them even. Not easy. So take your time. It's easier to cut things when they're on a flat surface, but the zucchini keeps wanting to wiggle a little bit and roll around, but that is okay. We're just gonna hold it steady. And you wanna keep going until you've got all of that kind of these nice big coins kind of together here. All right. So we're gonna do our tomato next, our eggplant. I already chopped up. And the type of eggplant that I'm using today is a regular Italian eggplant, but I actually really love the Japanese variety for this. If you can find it, oh my gosh, it's so, so good. Um, Japanese variety is long and thin and contains very few seeds, and therefore it's not very bitter. So if you have that on hand, fantastic. I'm gonna go ahead and slice our tomato next. Um, here's the stem. I like to cut straight across from the bottom. And if you have uh, that Japanese variety, go for it. It's really, really good. If you don't, because they are a little bit harder to come by, let's take that stem out of the top. Just going to kind of little circle around it, try to save as much tomato as possible. Um, if you don't, because they're kind of hard to come by, like I said, you can use this Italian variety. That works too. The only difference being that um, the Italian variety can be a little bit bitter. So if you want to remove some of that bitterness, you can go ahead and slice it. Sprinkle it with salt, as I did here, and then lay some paper towel to kind of absorb. You can see, right, how much liquid this has absorbed. So that is an option for you as well. All right, it's assembly time. So let's turn this off here. Actually, let's keep that one on up there. Okay. So we've got our onions. They smell amazing. I didn't add any salt. We could add a little pinch of salt in this step too. The herbs, everything going right in. And then we're gonna start layering in our vegetables. You just need enough of this mixture to kind of cover the bottom. I kind of may have overdone it, but I think it's okay. Just pat that down. And, um, and then we're gonna start with our, uh, our layering. You can also, if you're adding um, the Kalamata olives, you can add them in this stage too with the onions. This is optional. So these are pitted Kalamata olives. I really always think of olives as being a very kind of quintessential provincial um, food because there's so many olive trees there. It's really a beautiful, beautiful sight. And when the wind blows in the grove of an olive tree, because the leaves are kind of green on one side and silvery on the other, it's just amazing. It looks like it almost looks like a sea because you've got all the shimmering leaves that are just, um, you know, kind of sparkling in the sunlight. All right, we've got our olives down. Now it comes the layering. So you want to do sort of a, right, a stack. So I've got zucchini, tomato, eggplant. And you want to kind of keep consistent. So zucchini, tomato, eggplant, right? And you're going to go all the way around. And you want to just keep going. I start from the outside and I go in um, sort of spiral in towards the center. Zucchini, tomato, eggplant. <laughs> this, is, this is a bit of a tedious process. So if anyone has uh, stories they want to share about France or Provence or favorite um, foods from, from Provence, if you, anyone wants to add those into the chat box, feel free to share with your... This one's a little small eggplant. Zucchini. Share with your um, with your group there. You can also do you know do two if you want to if you have super thin zucchini, but I like to kind of mix them up. So where was I? All right. It does require a little bit of concentration. You want to create a flow for yourself, right? So you want to have a place where you start, where you know what you're going next. You've got your flow. Right? So this does come together pretty quickly once you kind of 
know where everything is. <laughs> and And that's it. So we're going to pop this into the oven. Need some more tomatoes. I have some more sliced up here. And this is going to be it. So again, this will bake for about 35 to 40 minutes. I'm going to do two because that eggplant was small. And uh, hopefully it'll be done in time for you guys to kind of see the finished result. But you get the idea here, right? It's kind of like, that one's very thin. It's kind of like a ratatouille, but you bake it. And um, again, that's really going to make it, it's going to make it a lot nicer than kind of standing over the stove and stirring things while they're cooking. And, you know, it's very, it gets very hot in my kitchen. So I like to just be able to have dishes that I can pop into the oven, not worry about it too much. So let's see, we have a couple more here. Let's see if we can squeeze them in. Okay, and this is just so beautiful. I'm gonna show you a close up of this because it's just like really a spectacular little dish, right? So you wanna kind of press that all down in there, okay? So look at that. You've got your onions on the bottom and let's put that in and see how it comes out. We're gonna add olive oil on top, a little bit of salt. You can sprinkle some herbs over the top as well if you want. Um, you can also do, like some people will do breadcrumbs on top with a mix of um, Parmesan and do like breadcrumbs and Parmesan together and sprinkle that over the top if you want like a crunchy cheesy topping. That's a good one too. And that's it. Very simple, right? <laughs> It does take a little bit of chopping and preparation, but it is so worth it because it's so beautiful and it tastes so good. And it's very simple. You know, it's just veggies, some olives, some olive oil, um, and those beautiful garden fresh herbs. So I hope you all at least are inspired to give this a try. Uh, I've got some extra, so maybe I'll make another one later. All right. Any questions or comments before I go to the next recipe? Um, yeah, Valerie said, Bulia base is, I guess that's how you say it. Yeah, and sun, Bulia base. <laughs> and sun drenched, sun drenched figs are among her favorites. Oh. Wow, yes. Thank you, Valerie, for sharing. I love Bulia base as well. For those of you that aren't familiar with Bulia base, it is, um, it is basically a seafood stew that's tomato based. Um, it's really, really good. I, I do love Bulia base as well. And the other one was figs with what? Um, sun and drenched figs. Sun drenched. Sun, sun, sun drenched, drenched figs. Sun drenched oh. figs. Those are her favorites. <laughs> That's beautiful. Yes, I love that. Sun drenched figs. Oh, there's nothing like quite like fresh figs. They're hard to find here. You can only really get them from California this time of year, or you know, in the fall, you can find them around here. But um, but they're hard. They're definitely hard to find. Okay, so we've completed our first recipe. Everything's in there. We're going to now go to the soup au pistou, which is the second one. Um, and just one quick edit on this. I wrote half a cup of peas from frozen thawed. I actually don't make this with peas, so I don't know why I decided to include that all of a sudden. So you can just scratch that out, leave the peas to the side, and every, but everything else is good and, and correct. So we're going to start again with our olive oil, go figure. And we're gonna heat up our soup pot. We're gonna add just enough to cover the bottom. You never really need much more than that. And you don't want your olive oil to get too hot. You already saw me dice an onion, so I'm gonna spare you that. So I've got my some onion diced up here, I'm ready to add that in. Um, and then we're just gonna cook that again until it gets nice and soft. We're gonna add herb de Provence. Right, this is a seasoning blend that you can find. Um, if you can't find herbe de Provence, it's not always easy to find uh, everywhere. So you can, I, I find, found this at, um, at Whole Foods, but you can also find it, I think Trader Joe's sells one, but basically you can also make your own. So mix savory, thyme, rosemary, basil, tarragon, and lavender flowers. Um, if you don't have some of those things, like I know I don't have savory, um, then you could still make this just leaving out one herb or so, 
but that's really the traditional herb de Provence is all of those herbs together, right? You could also just use thyme and rosemary. Those are very, very common. You'll miss out a little bit on some things, but it's not, too, it won't be too bad. Okay, so starting with our onion, get some heat on that. Get this nice and soft. You really want it to cook down. And then we're gonna add the herbs, carrots, zucchini. I, I just, look at this tray. I don't know if you can see how many different vegetables on this are on this tray, but if you think about like why, why cultures on the Mediterranean are some of the healthiest, healthiest cultures in the world, I think this is the answer right here. You've got so many vegetables in every single meal. Vegetables are the center focus of the plate. And then meats are kind of complementary. And then usually if it's a meat, it's a nice fresh fish, which we know is lean and high in omega-3 fatty acids. So, you know, there's a lot of sense when you start zooming in at the lifestyle and understanding, you know, what is it about these cultures that, are, that make people live for so long? Well, I think the answer is really right here. Fresh, fresh produce. So we've got our green beans going in. I have some that I chopped up. And the way you, I kind of chop them up, I buy them with the tips and tails cut off, which is much easier. So if you wanted to do the same, you could. And then you just kind of bunch them together like a little stack of firewood and chop them apart to get just these sort of like bite bite pieces, right? They don't all have to be even. They don't all have to be perfect. At the end of the day, you're just making soup. So did a question or a comment pop up while I work on this celery? Yes. Um, Judy wants to know, if you make your own herbs de Provence, what is the amount of each herb? Question. I would say it's primarily savory, thyme, and rosemary, and then secondarily basil, tarragon, and lavender. So you could do like one teaspoon of savory thyme and rosemary and then half a teaspoon of basil, tarragon, and lavender. That would kind of be the ratio because basil, tarragon, and lavender are sort of stronger, especially the lavender and the tarragon. So those should just be a little bit less, but it's pretty flexible. Yeah. Let's add those in too. Oh, this smells so good. All right. That's the end of them. Okay. And then, um, and then if you really want, you know, a more sophisticated recipe for herb de Provence, I'm just going to cut off, trim some of these pieces here. You could probably find something on Google, like how to make your own herb de Provence. I'm going to put this into the compost. And then with celery, you can see like sometimes there's a brown spot like that. Some people just like cut and don't use the whole thing. I use a peeler and just peel it away. Any kind of browning spots that look a little bit, look a little less than ideal, but they're still, you know, they're attached to other things that are very good. So let's get rid of that and then we'll keep the rest. We've added our herbs, we've added our onions. I have my water boiling back here because I wanted to um, kind of expedite things for our pasta, but you don't have to do this step. You can just add the water in with the pasta and just let it all boil together. With celery ribs, I like to turn them over cut kind of down the valley, right? To get more of a flat, flat surface. Some of these are still a little bit thick, so I'll do another cut or two, get them a little bit smaller, bunch them up, little bundle, tuck your fingers, roll right across. So a lot of, um, a lot of people buy a whole head of celery and then they don't really know what to do with all of it. Well, but on its own, I personally don't love raw celery. I find it's really good in soups and stews, but it's not my favorite to eat raw. Some people will just crunch on it with some hummus or peanut butter. Um, I, I actually find that I will buy a whole head of it and then freeze it. So I'll cut it up just like the onion and then toss it in a little Ziploc bag and freeze that. And then anytime I'm making super stew, I have my celery ready. If you have kept your celery for too long and it's gotten a little fatigued, maybe in the refrigerator, you can um, add, add it to cold water. So get the coldest water you can or even ice water and let it kind of take an ice bath and you'll see it'll kind of perk up a little bit. Sometimes celery is, you know, beyond repair, but you try not to let it get to that point. You can freeze it. 
you can perk it up in an ice bath. You can eat it raw. You can cook it, and as we're doing today. And then um, I think those are all my celery tips. Um, I know some people have a lot of success storing it if they wrap it in tin foil. That could be something else to try out. Um, you know, once you, you're taking a couple stocks off, you're not using it, wrap it in tin foil and keep it in the refrigerator. You could try that out. Um, okay, so we're ready for our next ingredients here. We've got the olive oil, the onions, the herbe de Provence. Let's add our carrots. So you can choose to peel. These two are peeled. You can choose to peel them or not. Leave that up to you. The peels are slightly better. So if you decide not to peel them, you are taking a little bit of a bitter risk, but you will be uh, rewarded with nutrients. So that's up to you. We're going to trim the tops, trim the bottoms, and just chop these up and add them in as well. So I go for really small. I like to have things really, really small for this soup. I kind of like that everything floats around and is kind of thin and cooks quickly. So I go for a smaller chop for this. Um, if your carrots are rolling on you, you can always cut them in half, get that flat surface, and finish your chopping that way. And uh, often the tip of the carrot is thinner, often, most of the time, right? The tip of the carrot is thinner than the top. So I like to just kind of cut up until it starts to get, you know, where it starts to get noticeably thicker. And then I'll stop, cut it in half. So everything kind of ends up being about the same size. And that's that. Chop carrot, in you go. So I think, you know, you can add the vegetables all at once, or you can kind of stagger them like I'm doing. We're going to add a turnip, too. So for this one, you definitely want to peel it. Um, I think some people eat turnip skins, but they're certainly not my favorite. <laughs> so you want to peel it. And we're going to cut the top and the bottom. And I'm just using sort of a standard turnip. Um, this time of year, you can find at the farmer's market, they sell hakurai turnips, which are divine. They can be eaten raw or um, cooked. They're really nice to try. So those are called hakurai, H-A-K-U-R-I, I think, hakurai. They're a Japanese variety. They're very yummy. Slicing the top, and then we've got our flat surface. I'm going to go ahead and make some discs to then go into matchsticks and then go into a small dice. So, Lido, do we have any questions or comments? How's everybody doing on our trip to France? So, yeah, I think they reached Provence already. <laughs> so, yeah. there's a question um, that from Eve, she wants to know, could she treat the brown spots on other veggies in the same way that you treated the, the celery? Yeah, so, um, Eve, thank you for asking that. So, um, you can definitely do this with fennel. Often you'll buy a nice, big, beautiful head of fennel, but it'll have some browning and stuff. Use that veggie peeler. Instead of cracking off those big chunks of fennel that are still very good, use the peeler and peel around them. Yeah, that's the, that's the main one. But you can peel off any kind of, you know, dents and dings and brown spots. As long as there's no slime or mold, I'm okay with it. And then there's an, uh, a comment um, from JM who says that you can dehydrate celery. Wow, that's really interesting. I, I have never tried dehydrated celery, but I bet it's super crunchy and delicious. That's a really fun idea. I have roasted celery before, um, which I love roasted celery. It gets sweet um, and it kind of like just melts in your mouth. It's, it's, it's really good. Yeah, very nice. Thank you for sharing that. Any other questions for me or, um, no, or but on I, how you dehydrate celery? No, <laughs> I have more questions. No, no, but I did put in the name of the Hakurai turnips. Oh, so that yeah, people know. Thank you. And I did yeah, Google I did Google for recipes for herbs at Provence, and they have quite a few. Um, so a lot of them are um, similar ratios to what you had recommended earlier. Great. All right. So you can see now, I, after I cut the um, turnip into slices, I stacked it up like a little deck of cards, and then I cut through it to make these kind of like more matchstick shapes. And then I'm gonna cut across. This is, this is a little bit tricky, right? Because the turnip tends to crumble apart on you because it's like, it's really, but you know, you just try to get a little, a little dice going. If you can, if you can. 
you know, everything cut about the same size. That's, that's what matters. Okay. So we've got our onions, our carrots, our celery, our turnips, our de Provence. We got one more veggie. Oh, two more veggies going in here. My goodness. Sorry. Sorry, green beans. I almost forgot about you. So we're going to add some zucchini. For this one, I'm going to turn the top. In the bottom, I'm not going to use the whole zucchini. The recipe only calls for about a cup, so I'll cut it in half, and then I would store this in a Ziploc bag and fridge until I wanted to use it. And then same thing here. I like to cut these long strips, right? Then you can put them on a flat surface and cut them into lengthy strips, right? Just a few. Now you've got your bundle of firewood again. Tie that all together. And cut across to make it nice. Okay. Oh my gosh, these smells are making me hungry. I haven't had lunch yet. I think this is um this is definitely activating activating my senses here. All right. So again, chop across a little dice, and you're done. The king goes in. You can add potato to this. You can add peppers, you can, you know, play around with different vegetables. I kind of like the way these ones, um, you know, marry together. They just, the flavors work out really, really nicely for this soup. So this is my kind of preference, but feel free to experiment. You know, if you've got a couple of mushrooms or uh, I think, I don't think eggplant would work well. Tomato would work, but it would give it a different taste. So you can play around with it. All right, Ingo the green beans. That's a lot of green beans. Still gonna be yummy. It's gonna be extra yummy. There's more green beans. Draw your veggies together. And now we're gonna add, I don't think I've added salt yet. Let's add a hefty pinch. Some fresh pepper if you can. I often crack my pepper over a steaming pot, and I think it it's not a great idea because it kind of mess, it kind of clogs up the um the grinder, right? So I just try to be fast about it. Right, because you've got the steam coming into the grinder, kind of gets things a little clogged. All right, and we're ready for our final ingredients. We have our water back here. Hot water, again, just to expedite the cooking, but you don't have to do it this way. You can just soak some cold water. I'm gonna turn that off. So let me just show you the pot, what it looks like in here before we get started with that water, before I can't tip it anymore. <laughs> so you can see everything's like a nice little dice. I mean, gosh, I would eat this just like this, wouldn't you? Just like have it as, as its own little vegetable medley. All right, water goes in. You're gonna need a little more water than you think. Like I'm telling myself that because we're gonna add that pasta in and the pasta is gonna absorb some water as well. You can throw in a can of beans, or gently place a can of beans in your soup. So rinse them first, add your shells. I'm using the super small little shells, if you can find those. You can of course omit the pasta. If you want to make this you know, gluten-free or you just want a little bit of a lighter soup, Definitely feel free to omit the pasta and um, make it just kind of like a veggie soup. I like the pasta. I like cooking the pasta in there. I feel like when you do that, it adds um, some starchiness to the water, which is really nice. So it's good. You can use gluten-free shells if that's what you want. If you've you know, got a sensitivity, feel free to do that as well. Questions, comments, anything? Everybody's just... They're just looking on our little journey. They just they just want to see the end result. <laughs> okay, okay, me too. Gosh. <laughs> All right, our final dish, and I'm gonna make the pesto that goes on top of the soup. I've got that basil ready here. I'm gonna make that in a moment. Our final dish is the tahtin. So of course, I felt like I couldn't do couldn't do a class that you know took place in France unless I included some version of a baguette. So this is, you know, just a standard grocery store baguette. Of course, if you want to get something local from Journeyman Bakery in Peekskill, I know um, he does a great baguette. Um, there's a new bread place opening up, I think this week or next. They do a nice uh, baguette as well. Um, and yeah, 
Very simple. We're going to start by toasting it. So you want to go ahead, get your bread on a little sheet pan. You can add, you know, add some olive oil to this at this stage if you want, little squiggles. And we're going to toast this first. This is our step one. Okay. Step two is we're going to make our own chive oil. So um, if you wanted to not do this, you can certainly just throw some bread on, on uh, some cheese on your bread and call it a tartine. But if you want to make it a little elevated, a little fancy, use up some of your summer herbs. And um, there's really, oh, there's nothing better. I think the combination of goat cheese or chevre, which we're using this one today, and um, chives is just, it's so good. You've got like that little onion flavor, um, wrapped in olive oil, drizzled on your chef. It's just like, oh my gosh, it's drooling starting to <laughs> you just think about it. Okay, so we're going to bunch up our chives. These chives are from our garden. And whenever you're working with chives, give them a little bit of a chop because oh, our soup is boiling. I can turn that down, let that simmer. Because otherwise, chives are like these long strands of spaghetti that'll just tangle up in your blender blade. So you want to chop them up, add them to your blender, and we're going to add some olive oil to this as well. Now it's great if you can let this infuse for, you know, at least, what did I write in the recipe? I think 10, I wrote 10 minutes and up to 24 hours. So you can certainly let it infuse longer, keep it in the refrigerator, keep it for a week and use, you know, chai oil on your eggs, chai oil on your soup, on your toast, on your anything, you know, it's, it's just a very versatile, um, anywhere you want olive oil with a little kick of onion, you can use this. So we're going to go and blend this up. You can do this with different herbs too. We're making chai bowl today, but you could do basil oil, which is really nice as well. You could do tarragon could be interesting. I haven't tried it, but tarragon's a bit strong. Um, dill would work, cilantro oil, you know, you can play around. So let's blend that up. It's going to turn very, very green. I'm going to add a little bit of salt in here. Then I'm using a high speed blender. You do want to try to use a good blender if you have one. Just look at this green, green gold. It's beautiful, right? So you've got this amazing olive oil infused, oh, infused with chives. I put it in a squeeze bottle. It's a little bit easier to work with when you're doing your tartine, but you can put it in a little, you know, spoon it over. You don't have to have a squeeze bottle to do this. All right, so while that's infusing, we're waiting for our toast to toast. Let's get our um, pesto together. So I'm gonna pull forward our food processor. Or should I say our fistu? Fistu, let's be correct. Right? And again, simple, simple, simple. So I have um, some Parmesan cheese. And uh, as I mentioned, because of the region of France that we're talking about, Provence, there is a lot of Parmesan cheese as well, because it kind of trickles over from Italy and there's a lot of kind of cross pollination with the different um, cuisines. So it's a really interesting place to, to dine. I think it's one of my, you know, favorite cuisines in the world. It's kind of that area. It's so fresh and you have all these Italian influences that are, are really nice. So we're going to take the, uh, the paper exterior off and you can either mince this yourself or, you know, put it in the food processor and let that do the work for you. I kind of opt for the slightly lazier version. So trim the bottom. It's going into a food processor anyway, right? So you can do that first. If you want to just have the food process to mint it for you. See, look at that. Beautiful. Okay. Then you can add your, we have our basil leaves here. Now, whenever I'm working with basil, I do prefer it to be quite dry if, if possible. So this is, is, you know, there's still a little bit of dampness here from the rain last night. I pulled these in from the, uh, from the garden. Oh, look at that. Stowaway, snappy, last of the snappies. So dry, dryish basil. Here's our quarter cup of Parmesan. And then of course, olive oil. 
olive oil, olive oil, olive oil everywhere in this uh, in this glass, huh? So it's useful to have a little spatula ready to kind of scoot down all that good stuff on the sides. And this is almost done. Um, I just want to make sure I'm consistent with what I have told you. Oh, yes. Okay, perfect. Smooth or smash by hand in a mortar and pestle. That's what I wanted to mention. If you don't want to do this in a food processor, good old-fashioned mortar and pestle. Put all of your um, basil leaves in here. So you would start with the garlic, smash that down. Then you would add the basil leaves, smash those down, and kind of drizzle in the oil and smash, 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 right? So you can do it that way as well. That's really the traditional way to make pesto. The uh, Italian and, and nonnas and French uh, commères, they did not have food processors. So this is our, our modern take. There we go. So you want it to be kind of chunky, but you know, still um, smooth enough where everything is, is kind of blended together. So there's your, your piece too. So this is gonna go on top of the soup. Questions or comments? And now our time is almost up. Yes, can you freeze the soup? Oh yeah, absolutely. It would be great to freeze. Anything else? That's that was the only right one? Now. Okay. That's it for now. All right. Quiet group so, today. Um, yeah, that's all right. Uh, so the soup, oh, I think it's hot out. Everyone's like, Ooh. The concept of, of soup today is a little bit daunting. I understand. Um, you can have this hot or cold, though. It's, it's a soup that can be enjoyed either way. Um, and if you want to come back tomorrow, we're going to be making chilled soups. So we're going to be making only cold soups, um, which is very exciting to me. <laughs> so there's our piece, too. Oh my God. So, smells so good. I just want you guys to close your eyes and picture basil and picture cutting up basil and then that smell. That's what this smells like. Amazing. All right. Our toasts are toasted. So at this point, you've got your little toast ready to go. Yeah, perfect. Each one is going to get a little bit of goat cheese. I love this because it's just it's so simple. This is extremely hot. Maybe I should demonstrate a, a kinder way to pick these up <laughs> so you guys don't bring I almost don't feel anything anymore. It's just what I'm used to. But, um, but definitely they are warm, toasty, toasty. So you can use your tongs to grab them up and pop them on a plate. Okay. Pop, move this over to the side so nobody gets burned. Primarily myself, because I will forget <laughs> that that's hot. Okay, and you can just arrange these on a little plate. Get your cheese ready. Use a simple butter knife for this. And you do want to um, use goat cheese that's at least room temperature so it's spreadable, right? And that's it. These are really easy to put together. This is perhaps the easiest recipe today, I think. So, any final questions or comments? Then I'm going to show you all the. Uh, the soup and the, the um, recipe in the oven there, the sort of baked ratatouille. Yes, could you put nuts in the pesto? Yeah, absolutely. Yeah, I mean, it's a piece too traditionally does not have nuts, I think, but you certainly could if you wanted to add some nuts. That's a very, that's more like a traditional Italian pesto. So you've got your little goat cheese, Tartlets, I'm not going to do them all because it's not that interesting to watch me spread cheese on bread. <laughs> and then you can add your chai oil on each one. Look at that. It's beautiful, right? All right. Let's check on our friends here. We're going to get our um, soup in a bowl. So the most important thing is that your pasta be cooked. This looks good. The, the shells look nice and soft. Beautiful. They're small, so they're going to cook fairly quickly. So at this point, you would take your beautiful vegetable soup. You would take a little bit of your pesto, pisto, and serve it on top and kind of swirl that in. So that's going to be the soup recipe, right? All right. And then the final one might not be done yet. 
but let's check on it anyway, just to show you all what it looks like. Oh my gosh, it's so beautiful. You really want to cook this until everything is nice and soft. So you can see there's some browning happening around the edges here on these vegetables, right? It's bubbling, it smells amazing. And this is such a you know nice thing to bring to a picnic or even like um, you know a, a gathering with friends now that we can gather safely a little bit more. Um, so feel free to, if you're feeling slightly ambitious, you can give this one a try, a little bit less ambitious, you know, maybe more um, you know, intermediate. <laughs> you could try the, uh, the soup and then very, very simple, basic beginner. Go ahead and make your chive oil crostini. All of these things are wonderful to enjoy um, on your own or share, share with that, share with a friend or a neighbor or just keep it to yourself. <laughs> All right, everyone, that's our time for today. So thank you so, so much for watching. Join me again tomorrow for our chilled soups class if you'd like to. I think it's a morning time. I think it starts at 10 tomorrow. We're experimenting with a little bit of a different time frame. Um, see how that goes. And uh, again, thank you so much for watching. Please share with your friends and family if you know these videos are, are fun and interesting for you to learn from. Um, I'm always just so touched and grateful uh, that you're here with me today. So devoting your time and energy to cooking and to bettering your health and nutrition. Um, Alita, as always, thank you for moderating. Any final, Pleasure. final, final questions so the, or comments? Yes, one quick question. Um, can the Tain yeah. Provencal be served cold? Oh, yes, absolutely. Hot or cold. Yeah, it's great. All three of these, hot or cold. And just a whole lot of wonderful comments about how great everything looks Yay. and looks oh, delicious and they can't wait to try it. <laughs> Yay. Well, thank you so much. If you do make the recipe and, and you're happy with it, uh, feel free to send me an email. Let me know how it came out. If you made the recipe and you're not happy with it or it didn't come out as you wanted, feel free to contact me. I'm always happy to troubleshoot things with people and try to figure out kind of what went wrong. Um, you know, cooking can be difficult and intimidating and hopefully... Um, you know, hopefully with these classes, it makes it a little more approachable. So thanks everyone. Stay cool outside. I hope you can all be in air conditioned spaces today or a body of water somewhere. Or if you are tuning in from the Mediterranean, I hope you're swimming. <laughs> all right. Bye. Take care.